Praise the Lord. This is Dr. C. Dexter Wise III, and welcome back to our mighty mini-series, Love Connection, God, Neighbor, and You. We've been talking about Jesus' response to a question that came to him from a lawyer. Uh, this whole exchange is uh, recorded in Matthew chapter 22, verses 35 through 40. And this particular lawyer asked Jesus, what is the great commandment? And Jesus essentially said to him that I will answer you and tell you that uh, the best way to answer that commandment can be done as easy as one, two, three. One, there is one word that connects all of the 600 laws in the Bible to each other and all of us to God. Two, all of those 600 commandments can be summarized in two commandments or summarized down to two commandments. One, love the Lord your God, and two, love your neighbor as yourself. And three, there are three dimensions, three areas, three directions, three ways that we can express this love, and that is number one, love your God, love your neighbor, and love yourself. The last time we were together, we talked about loving God with all your heart, all your mind and all your soul, and now we're gonna talk about loving your neighbor. Our text comes from that same passage. This time, however, we're gonna focus on Matthew chapter 22, verse 39a, where Jesus says, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor. Now that you know where we are, Let's have a word of prayer. Thank you, Father, for bringing us together. Thank you for allowing us simply to be alive, to enjoy this day, enjoy you, and to enjoy each other. Help us as we attempt to unpack your word, that as we open it, it might open us and then fill us with your love and your presence. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake. Amen. Okay, now that you know where we are, that was the love text, Matthew chapter 22, verse 39a. Let's go to the love teaching. In this love teaching section, we want to notice the fact that the Pharisee asked Jesus about the great commandment. What is the one great commandment? And Jesus gave him this commandment by saying the first is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. Then he adds a bonus, and the second one is like it. Well, he didn't ask for the second one, he just asked for the first one. And that's what I like about Jesus. He always gives you more than you expected. You remember when he went to that wedding and they ran out of wine, he ended up turning six water pots into wine. I promise you they had plenty of wine left over. Same thing when he had the, the crowd of 5,000 people that was, was hungry. Uh, he took two fish and five loaves of bread, fed 5,000 people. That's just the men, not counting the women and children. And when it was left over, when they were finished, they had 12 baskets left over. So when you come to Jesus, he gives you what you asked for and some more. He only asked for the great commandment, and Jesus says, okay, here's the first one, now I'm gonna give you a bonus, here's the second one. And the second one is to love your neighbor, to love your neighbor. Now, when we think about this idea of loving your neighbor, there are at least four things that come to my mind that I wanna put on your mind. The first thing is this, you are a part of a neighborhood. You are a part of a neighborhood. If the nearest house to you is a few feet away, or a few yards away, or a few miles away, you are still a part of a neighborhood. It doesn't matter how close your neighbors live to you, you are a part of a neighborhood, if for no other reason than the fact that you are a part of God's creation. Think about it this way. Uh, God created a neighborhood in, in the beginning. He created a neighborhood. And then he created us and moved us into the neighborhood. Now, I would dare say that all the other things, the other beings that were in the neighborhood before we got here said, you know, boy, this is great. This is great. And then when we moved in, uh-oh, there goes the neighborhood. <laughs> it seems like it was only upon our introduction into the neighborhood of creation. It was our introduction that started making things go downhill. And so this whole idea of global warming and environmental concerns and all of that, it really does make sense because we are neighbors. We are a part 
of this universe. We are part of the world. And uh, whether you see your neighbor next door, whether you talk to your neighbor next door, you are a part of a neighborhood. Uh, the mere fact that technology has connected us so that we can talk to people all around the world instantaneously. We can see what's going on in China from Columbus, Ohio. And so it's not like we, the fact that we have to travel a day to get to them means that they are not connected to us. We are so connected now that the world is shrinking in terms of our relationship to each other. And so whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, you are a part of a neighborhood. Number two, you are a neighbor. Since you are a part of a neighborhood, that makes you a neighbor. And a neighbor is a person who is related to or connected to somebody in their neighborhood. Now, whether you are a good neighbor or a terrible neighbor or something in between, that's a whole nother issue. That's something for you to ask your neighbor. But the fact of the matter is, in your consciousness and my consciousness, we ought to begin to think of ourselves as neighbors. Uh, we live in a time and a day, and uh, I know that it's, it's true in, in my case, Part of the reason why we don't interact with our neighbors the way we used to is because we don't have to. We're so blessed that we have houses that we don't have to come out of after we get into. Consider this. You can get up on a winter day and uh, it could be 10 degrees outside. You come down uh, from, your, from your bedroom, wherever you come out of your house, get in your garage, get in your car, and drive to work into a covered garage and you've never been in the air, okay? And so because you never have to roll down your windows, because you don't have to get out your car, you can go from your house to your job without actually interacting with anybody because that's the way it is now. And then when you come home, you, got, you don't have to go to the movies because you got HBO, you got Netflix. Uh, you don't have to go to a restaurant because you got TV dinners, you got all kinds of things that you can pick up fast foods. Many of the things that we used to have to come outside to at least see people, we don't have to do anymore because we can do it all inside of our house. And the fact that we can do so much inside of our house makes us less likely to interact with people who are uh, around us. And so the fact of the matter is that even though we do not interact with our neighbors because we don't have to the way that we used to, we are neighbors. And we should get that in our mind. We are neighbors. We live in a neighborhood and we are neighbors. Number three, you have a neighbor. Whether you know him or not, whether you uh, like him or not, you have a neighbor. So if you are neighbors, if you are a neighbor, that means that the other person is your neighbor. You are their neighbor, they are your neighbor. So at first, we need to see ourselves in terms of being their neighbor, and then we need to see that they are our neighbor. In other words, we look at them not simply as strangers, not simply as other people getting in their cars, going to work like we do, but as neighbors, people who are a part of the community, people who have a vested interest as we do, people who, who not only live near us geographically, but people who share the planet, who share problems, who share this place, who share values, and so on and so forth. So these neighbors that you have, they may be people who live with you. Now that's, that's a mighty point there. They are people who live with you. Don't assume that your first and nearest neighbor is the one who lives next door. Your nearest neighbor might be the one that lives down the hall or across the room. And therefore, that is within your house, within your own family. And so when it talks about loving your neighbor, that neighbor includes the people who live with you, the people who are part of your family. Then the neighbor may be people who live near you but are not like you. We're in such a uh, diverse environment now that it's possible to have people from various parts of the world living on the same street side by side. Uh, and so they, they may be nothing like you. They may not look like you. They may not act like you. They may not speak like you. They may not dress like you. But the mere fact that they are not like you and yet near you does not negate the fact that they are your neighbor. So uh, our neighbors are people who live near us regardless of the fact of whether or not they are like us. Then your neighbor may be a person who lives near you, but you don't like. <laughs> 
a person who lives near you, but you don't like. Uh, we don't usually get to pick our neighbors. We don't usually get to screen who moves in besides us. And matter of fact, that's a good thing because they might have screened us out. But the fact of the matter is that just because a person uh, lives near you, that makes them your neighbor, whether you like them or not. And liking them or not liking them does not take away your responsibility to treat them in a neighborly fashion. And so here is what this commandment is telling us, that we should love our neighbor, that person who lives near us, whether we like them or not. And then fourthly, your neighbor is a person who plain doesn't like you and you don't like them. Sometimes you don't like your neighbor, but they like you. And they're always coming over. They always want to bring you stuff. They always want to borrow stuff. It's like, here they come again. So number one, you are part of a neighborhood. Number two, you are a neighbor. Number three, you have a neighbor. And then number four, you are commanded to love your neighbor. Because they are your neighbor, you are commanded to love them. This is a love, not a uh, stay over their house all night love not a eat on their grill all, all day or all, all weekend kind of love. It's not a love that makes you feel warm and fuzzy every time you see them. But this love that we should have for our neighbor is a kind of love that is, again, agape love. It is a love where we desire their best, their highest, their interest, best and highest interest, that they can be all that God has designed and created them to be. We love them because just like us, they are a creation of God. And so this notion of loving your neighbor commands us to understand our situation in creation as a person uh, who lives in a neighborhood, as a person who is to be regarded as a neighbor, a person who has neighbors, and a person who understands that even though they may not be everything I want them to be, that I've been commanded to love them. And it is the love that we give to our neighbors that not only reflects the love that God has given to us, but it's that same kind of love that draws them not just close to us, but draws them closer to God. Okay, you got this lesson for today. We're talking about loving our neighbor. Now let's look at the love talk and we'll be done for today. Number one, how has advances in technology changed the concept of neighborhood? Number two, why do you think that Jesus says loving our neighbor is like loving God as opposed to just another completely separate commandment? Number three, describe the neighborhood you grew up in. Then describe the neighborhood you now live in. What are some of the differences? Elaborate. Number four, what kind of neighbor do you think your neighbors would consider you? Why do you think that? Elaborate on that. And then number five, what concrete practical steps can you take to express love for your neighbor? Okay, that's it for today. We've been talking about loving our neighbor, and next time we're going to talk about loving ourselves. Love yourself. Check you out next time.